April 27, 2011 was a day that many across the country remember. It's a day that many will continue to remember. And our own Brad Huffines remembers that day very well. As Brad, you were on the air, you were covering this as it was happening. What do you remember about that day? So um, at the time, I was the chief meteorologist of uh, WAAY-TV, Channel 31 in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, the week before, we had been watching this event unfold. Um, and we knew it was going to be a, you know, some form of a pretty strong severe weather outbreak uh, in, uh, in Dixie Alley. Um, as a lot of people know, you know, there's, there's Tornado Alley, the space through northwest Texas, Oklahoma, into southeast Missouri, uh, southwest Missouri, southeast Kansas. And there's Dixie Alley, which goes from basically central Mississippi through north Alabama and into central Tennessee. That's the part of the country that has, part of the world that has the longest track EF3 to EF5 tornadoes in the world. Um, and we knew that this was going to be a bad day. Uh, those of us who work in meteorology, those of us who have mete who are meteorologists in the southeast, we see these events happen. And with the uh, just the population density of the southeast versus the plains, where in the plains people live in clumps, in the southeast they kind of live everywhere. Uh, there are cities, but between the cities there's population. There's people that live everywhere, and that's what makes uh, these types of storms so. Uh, um, so dreadful for those of us who are covering them and so dreadful for people that uh, live there. So we kind of knew four or five days out that a really good chance of a, of a devastating outbreak would happen. You honestly, you can never forecast, um, can never forecast what happened that day. You just can't, you know, something bad's going to happen, but in the Southeast, unlike the plains in the plains, every time there are all the ingredients together, Megan, when all the ingredients happen, you know it's kind of predictable what's going to happen. I, I saw in the southeast, in my, um, I've lived east of the Mississippi River since 1989. I've seen multiple times when all the ingredients seem to be together, and yet something doesn't happen to where you think it's going to happen. Unlike what I, you know, I, I have my degree in meteorology from University of Oklahoma. Those of us who are OU grads, you know, we we live in Oklahoma. We went to OU, and we kind of have this, you know, kind of back of back of our mind. Oh, we've got this. We're, you know, we went to the best meteorology school in the world. Uh, we've seen virtually everything. Come on. And then something like this happens, and it humbles you uh, because all the ingredients were there. But yet, uh, my messaging to the people of North Alabama bleeding into the event was, you know, stay weather aware. Uh, be prepared for for a terrible outbreak because you know we see these things happen a couple of times a year and you just don't know when everything really truly is going to come together so um, that day April 27th in the morning the surprising part of this uh, storm system was it caused uh, morning thunderstorms uh, a, a, a morning um, supercells in the morning uh, one tornado ripped through Gunnersville State Park um, a couple of tornadoes went through other parts of North Alabama with, you know, accurate warnings. Uh, a tornado watch was issued far earlier than the Storm Prediction Center thought that they would have to issue one for, to cover those storms. And the numerous warnings, including some tornadoes in the morning. And, and uh, you know, those of us who work in meteorology kind of know that once the atmosphere is primed, you know, Megan, you know, when storms go through a primed atmosphere, what's our first thought? You know, we've kind of squeezed it out, right? We, we've kind of taken some of that energy and 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 squeezed it out, and the atmosphere has stabilized a little bit. Um, in this case, those morning storms went through, knocked out a lot of power for a lot of people. Um, then late morning, uh, new tornado watch, all the parameters were there, and we start seeing supercells developing in uh, eastern Mississippi. And, um, you know, that, that's kind of the dread and the pit of my stomach, uh, is seeing what these storms, where they were developing, what the trajectories were. And in the next 18 hours, we had uh, the densest outbreak of tornadoes in recorded American history. Um, but didn't get a lot of headlines. What gets headlines in Alabama is the Tuscaloosa tornado, the big one in Tuscaloosa. That was one of 62, 63 tornadoes that day. In the 11 counties of North Alabama, which is the northern fifth of the state, we took 40 confirmed tornado tracks. Um, 
11 counties in North Alabama is not a large area. We took 40 tornadoes in 18 hours that were confirmed, that were tracked and confirmed, um, including the longest track uh, EF5 in recorded in American history. It started uh, near Smithville, I believe, Mississippi, and lifted just to the southwest of my house in uh, northern Madison County, Alabama. Uh, that one is the one that gets you know, a lot of press, a lot of local press. But there was something that happened, Megan, and it changed the course of my life, honestly. Um, I'm going to show you a, a, a piece of video. We were on, I was on the air for 18 straight hours with uh, a meteorologist named Dale Bader, B-A-D-E-R, and Chris Davis. And we were tag teaming back and forth. And, you know, Chris at one time went out to do some, some running the storms around, you know, chasing the storms. Um, I'd been on the phone with meteorologist Gary Dobbs. Um, Gary, long time, long time, well loved uh, TV weatherman for a while, then then got his got enough education to be called a meteorologist. Uh, went home. Uh, he sent his wife to his parents' house in Decatur, Alabama, that day, and he decided he was going to stand on his uh, front porch and report to me on television what um, what he saw. Uh, because he was looking at radar, he'd gotten his weather call uh, as weather call was credited by the National Weather Service's meteorologist in charge at the time as being the last communications infrastructure that was left standing in this event. Um, he got him on the phone and we talked to him and I kept telling him, Gary, you know, get in your cellar, go get in your storm cellar. Uh, if the storm's coming, I see where you are and the storm is coming right at you. And he's like, no, it's not coming yet. It's not coming yet. Um, and then suddenly, you know, Gary said, oh, the, the tornado's coming. I've got to go. And he hung up. Um, so I, I'm, I was assuming he was, he went and get in his, he went to get in a storm cellar. The coverage continued. I didn't hear back what happened to Gary for probably eight or nine hours, honestly. What happened to Gary was, um, the mile and a half wide EF5, basically he was in the middle of that track. And, and uh, a mile and a half tornado isn't just one big spinning mass. It's a, it's the, I'll refer to it as kind of a Medusa's hair of tornadoes and funnel clouds that are dancing in a generalized pattern, some general circulation, but there are, but there are funnels that come out. I mean, it's, it's, it's honestly, it's nightmarish for people who have been through it. And he was looking across the road and there was a stand of trees and this tornado path was so wide he couldn't see the left and right. He couldn't see the funnel. It just looked like a big black mass coming at him until one of these small funnels, apparently big one, just appeared and formed and was coming right at him. And he said, after he hung up when I talked to him later, the story that he tells is uh, he saw the oak tree in his front yard start to shake and like second second one second it was full of full of leaves next second all the leaves were gone next second the tree looked like a bunch of splinters right in front of him as he turned to run through his house he was hearing his house being destroyed behind him and he told me later he said you'd never know what the sound of your car hitting your roof until the moment your car hits your roof you know that's your car. He dove into a closet, and as he dove into the closet, and his house was being hit, apparently the floor must have dropped out, and he was pulled out from under whatever was left of his house and sent airborne, where he hit the ground, rolled. He saw the dryer coming at him. Dryer must have, dryer hit him and injured some ribs. Um, then the debris from his house began to pile all around him. And that's probably what saved his life, he said. And that was, I don't know, within 30 seconds of being on television with me. Uh, trying to uh, just, you know, trying to tell him to seek shelter, but he wanted to help people and he wanted to see eyes on. This tornado had just destroyed Hackleburg, Alabama and Phil Campbell, Alabama, then went into a national forest. And it hadn't been confirmed yet. This tornado was on the ground for probably 50 miles before it was confirmed because those towns were destroyed to the point that no communications were getting out. 
And that's one of the things, Megan, that I, I, it's still unnerving to me that with the technology that we have today, and Chris Darden, the meteorologist in charge at the National Weather Service in Birmingham, learned from someone who went, a, a meteorologist in uh, Boulder, Colorado, after the Waldo Canyon fires and then the floods. He heard a presentation from that meteorologist in charge, in the, and, and she said, what they learned that day is that when you don't hear from somebody, don't think everything's fine. It usually means the worst has happened. And so one of you all just said, we, we, we haven't heard from Phil Campbell or Hackleberg and Chris knew that's the worst probably has happened to those two small towns. Now, this is just one of the 40, to 40 tornadoes. Um, and that was the one that, that probably had the highest single death toll was along that path. Um, that was one of the things that helped change the course of my life. We found out about Gary the next late that night. He was in the hospital. Someone, sheriff's deputy rolled up and uh, his storm shelter was used by some employees of the restaurant next door for where he lived in semi-rural uh, Lawrence County. Um, and they saw Mr. Dobbs fly over the storm shelter, they said. Um, but that that was that was a that was a scary moment. But I didn't know to be scared until a few hours later, because the video that I'm going to show you, uh, I've been teaching emergency management for FEMA for twenty since 1996 uh, for 25 years. Um, and when I was a child, I I wanted I was scared to death of tornadoes. Lived in Oklahoma, that's why when I was seven years old, I knew I was going to get my degree in meteorology from the University of Oklahoma and work television. And because I wanted to help children not be scared, literally, that's what drove me into this industry. Uh, I don't know your specific story, Megan. Yours is probably rooted in your childhood. Um, almost every meteorologist is, right? They all are. It's either storms or tropical weather or something. It's, it is something. Uh, so I was doing what I had been doing for 27 years that day. Uh, so I started teaching for FEMA because I wanted to help local governments learn how to speak to their, their customers, their, their, their citizens, their, their taxpayers better. I call them customers. Um, so I'd been through enough emergency management training and exercise training, disaster exercise training, um, and seen enough stories and have worked for FEMA long enough, worked the television long enough to know that the possible is possible. Uh, you don't really think it until you see it happen again and again. I was on CNN uh, two days before Hurricane Katrina hit, warning people, almost begging them to evacuate. And I knew they couldn't get out by that time. Um, begging them to seek high ground, go to the second floor of their homes, third floor if they had it. Um, and then we know that, what, 2,000 plus people basically drowned. Um, so I had that memory that the possible is possible, that bowl called New Orleans filled up with water. So um, on, on this day, I began, it kind of just, I don't know, the, the, the ghosts of all these things I've lived through as a meteorologist um, really come, came together when uh, I had heard that the tornado, when it crossed the Tennessee River, it took down uh, the power lines from the Tennessee Valley Authority nuclear power plant. And when that happened, that this is about a third of the way through the densest outbreak of tornadoes in recorded American history. I knew that at that moment, all of the northern fifth of the state of Alabama, almost all the northern part of Mississippi had lost power. Uh, and what you'll hear in this video, you know, this is kind of my television broadcast voice. I'm from Oklahoma. Uh, I used to sound like an Oklahoma kid. I went through a lot of voice and diction. I went through a lot of training and classes. I went through speech therapy to try to remove that, to exorcise that Oklahoma accent out of me. And yet I showed this video to a, a FEMA group in Puyallup, Washington, um, about six months after the event. Uh, I don't know why I showed it, but when I showed it, I heard something that disturbed me. Uh, and I want to show you that now and show you so you can hear the difference between what I sound like now 
I'm speaking from my diaphragm. I'm speaking slowly. I'm in control of my thought process. This is what made me a, a successful television meteorologist was being able to control the moment and walk people through these disasters to remain calm. My, my branding uh, please take the information we're providing to you and relay that if you can via cell phone communication back to your loved ones. Absolutely. This is when uh, we, we, the, the community is going to need your help now. Uh, we, we can't exercise these things in, in uh, emergency management exercises, although maybe we should start. Um, there, but now the power is cut to, to, to hundreds of thousands, potentially, of people in North Alabama. If you are somehow hearing us, uh, if, whether you live in a place without, that has power, or you are hearing us in any, any other format, any other way, uh, we, you pick up your phone, call folks in Gunnersville, Albertville, Bo, uh, Boaz, tell them to seek shelter immediately. Please call and don't stop until you get a hold of them, all right? There, there are going to be some people that are going to need you. A uh, public information statement has just been issued by the National Weather Service. Uh, main power line cut at Browns Ferry Nuke clear plants, and thus nearly all of North Alabama is without power as of this moment. Storm, again, has a, a potential for producing tornadic winds right now, and that storm is approaching, Speak is approaching Aldridge Grove, the same. So what you heard there, a lot of us who were alive when Challenger blew up, uh, remember it's the haunting words. It was uh, Challenger go at throttle, throttle up, and then we heard the Pilots say, Roger, go at throttle up, and that's when it blew up. Uh, the haunting words to me uh, in that video isn't just hearing my voice change. I mean, hey, Megan, you heard it. Um, I, I was the Oklahoma boy once again, talking like this. I, 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 my accent came out, and I, I talked about, you know, folks, they're going to need you. You heard that this Oklahoma teenager emerge out of that television Brad. And, and I, I didn't notice it at the time. And if you notice, within about 45 seconds, I was back to broadcast Brad. But the words that haunt me are the ones that say all of North Alabama has lost power. Because I knew at that moment, uh, we'd been thrown back into the 1800s in technology. Uh, at that moment, we had been, uh, I mean, the several hundred thousand people were about to go through the worst outbreak of tornadoes in recorded American history and didn't have warning. And that's what you heard in my voice was, uh, and what was told me, not in Puyallup, Washington, when I showed it, noticed it, and I get emotional about it, and I don't hide it. I'm not embarrassed about it went to Bastrop, Texas, and had the fire chief tell me when I showed this video and asked the class, I said, 100 people, I said, what, just ha what happened to my voice? I changed. And he said, Brad, what you heard in your voice was hopelessness. Uh, you'd prepared all your life for this moment, and you were ready. And the storm took away your ability to communicate. What you heard, Brad, was hopelessness. And that's exactly what I felt. Was uh, these things were big and these things were bad and they're moving at 60 to 80 miles an hour that day. What I heard in my voice was Brad that had worked 27 years for that moment was neutered. I couldn't help people. Uh, and that affects me today. Um, it's part of my PTSD that I've gotten literal therapy for. Uh, it's hard to be on television when you have, you know, over 175 people that lose their lives on your watch. It's not your responsibility. You did all that you could. Um, I had a lot of people tell me that my coverage helped to save their life. I had a ton of people tell me that weather call saved their life. We have videos about that that we've been airing for years on weather calls. <laughs> websites and aired on TV station. Lots of people say that. Uh, but what I realized that that moment is that it was a hopelessness. And the only hope that I realized that people had at that moment uh, was a service called weather call. Uh, because we made 232,000 phone calls that day. Uh, uh, men save people's lives.
because they had no other radio. They had no television. They, the only battery operated radio someone owns is in their car. Uh, they had no sirens. They had nothing. Cell towers were going down one by one as their batteries were running out. Their generators were running out of fuel. But Weather Call was still making phone calls within moments of when the warnings were issued. And uh, it saved, we had 10,000 subscribers uh, at that time, maybe 12,000, a lot. And Weather Call was plugging along, 232,000 phone calls in an 18-hour period of time. Uh, saved a lot of lives. Well, Brad, we appreciate you sharing that with us. And to everyone that has been through April 27th, 2011, to everyone that has ever been through a significant weather event or event in their life, we know what you're going through. And there are people out there. You can always talk to people. You can always reach out to me. Always find me. I'm findable. You can find me. Yeah, do, do a search for me and you can find me on the internet. No question about that. Uh, and I say that to every human being I walk across. My phone rings at two o'clock in the morning and it's a stranger saying, Brad, I need to talk. I'll answer and I'll talk. I may not have the answers, but I'll listen. And I want you to do the same thing for others. Every watching this video, I want you to be that person for others. Thank you, Brad. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm.